Welcome to day two of the symposium in honor of the 50th anniversary of the discovery of quasars by Martin Schmidt. Now that Martin has taken his seat, we can proceed with the first talk, which is by Michael Ericlaeus, The Broad Emission Lines of Quasars. And then there's a long stuff I'm sure you'll learn all about. <laughs> thanks, thanks very much. It's really a pleasure to be here. I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation. Uh, I have never met uh, Martin Schmidt, but a lot of the work that I'm going to talk about was actually begun right here, not in here, but in the astronomy department at Caltech. The roots of the work that I'll describe today go back to the 80s, when uh, Halpern and Filipenko and Oak were members of this department, and they began the work that turned into my thesis project. I was a student with Jules Halpern, in the late 80s and early 90s. And that's uh, how I became interested in the topics that I will describe today. Okay, so um, the initial view of what is a quasar broadline region, the source of the broad emission lines that are one of the defining characteristics, indeed a hallmark of quasars, is shown in this cartoon. Um, Clouds of ionized gas are orbiting a source of ionizing radiation. The, the picture is not very specific. Uh, it invokes clouds buzzing around. They're photoionized by high energy radiation from this source right there, which we call the central engine. And the uh, clouds emit uh, lines. The bulk motion of the clouds is responsible for the broadening of the lines. And the ionizing radiation comes from this Mitsubishi accretion powered central engine, which takes in gas from the host galaxy, processes it, and converts it into relativistic particles and uh, soft X ray and ultraviolet photons. Uh, but ever since the beginning, when this picture was introduced, um, the whole idea of clouds was somewhat problematic. The survival of clouds was always a puzzle. If you put them in intersecting, uh, Keplerian orbits, they will crash into each other because they have to have a finite size, and very quickly the system will be destroyed. Um, there was a series, a lot of activity, and a series of papers by Matthews and Krolik in the late 70s and early 80s that examined the idea. They found a lot of ways to destroy the clouds, but not many good ways to produce them. So, in a sense, we were at an impasse for quite a, a long time. Observa observational tests came a little later. Um, so essentially, the smoothness of the line profiles is one of the main observational constraints. And then reverberation mapping has provided constraints, which I will refer to gradually in the rest of the talk. Uh, the smoothness of the line profiles suggests that we're looking at a continuous medium, not a collection of discrete clouds. And today, we think that the discrete cloud picture is inadequate. That doesn't mean that the medium is smooth. Uh, if we want to continue to think of clouds in a heuristic picture, that's fine. But we have to remember that they're not discrete clouds that are buzzing around. They're better thought of as density, con density enhancement in, uh, enhancements in an otherwise continuous medium. So today, I would argue that it is imperative to understand the structure and properties of the broadline region. Uh, and the reason is because the broadlines are now used as tools for a number of applications. You heard yesterday in Brad Peterson's talk and other talks in the afternoon session, that we're using the broad emission lines as a um, tool to find, to measure the masses of black holes. I'll also give you another example today where uh, we can use the broad emission lines to study the dynamics of the outer accretion disk and to search for binary supermassive black holes or recoiling black holes. Um, moreover, the broad lines are as I said, a defining characteristic of AGMs. And we really would like to know what we are studying when we're looking at the broad lines. Are we studying, excuse me, the accretion flow? Are we studying an outflow? Studying the outflow is worthwhile because it's a source of feedback that is invoked often in scenarios for galaxy evolution. Or, God forbid, are we just studying the weather? Okay, so I will proceed by giving you one example of how we use the broad emission lines as a tool. And through there, I will motivate further the need to understand the structure of the broad line region. Then I'll go on and mention my approach, my own approach to 
studying and understanding the origin of the broad lines. Okay. So binary supermassive black holes seem to be an inevitable stage in the evolution of the remnant of a merger between two galaxies. They are the penultimate stage in the evolution of the two black holes. And the picture is as follows. The two parent galaxies merge. Very quickly, the black holes find each other at the bottom of the potential well. They form a bound binary. Once they reach the stage where the binary hardens, that means the orbital velocity exceeds the velocity dispersion of the two stars, uh, the binary might stall. And it might stall because we ran out of mechanisms for extracting angular momentum from the orbit. That was thought, uh, after the initial models were made in the late 70s, that was thought to occur at a separation of about a parsec or at just under one parsec. More modern work suggests that that may not be as big of a problem as initially suspected. But that suggests that it's a very good idea to find these binaries. We can evaluate the final parsec problem or the last parsec problem, and we can understand by studying them uh, what are the mechanisms that lead to the decay of the orbit at those la last stages? There are also progenitors of strong gravitational wave sources and transients. So if we are to observe uh, high freq um, low frequency gravitational waves, uh, we need to know what the sources might be. They've also been invoked to explain a number of phenomena. Examples include the formation and subsequent erosion of stellar cusps, precessing radio jets, X-shaped radio sources. So under, to undertake um, a search like this, most of the pra practitioners adopt the, the hypothesis shown by this figure. I direct your attention to the picture on the right. Here you see a binary with an uneven mass embedded in a circumbinary disk. The more massive object stays close to the center of mass, whereas the less massive object spends a lot of time close to the inner rim of the circumbinary disk. And that disk forms as, as a result of the previous evolution of the system. Because this object is closer to the rim, especially if the orbit is eccentric, it has easy access to the gaseous reservoir, and it can accrete more easily than the primary. So in this picture, we're thinking of one active black hole orbiting around a more massive and not active black hole. So if the broadline region then, uh, if we think about the broadline region as gas that is bound to the smaller of the two black holes, the analogy we can draw is that is with, with a single line spectroscopic binary. So as the black hole moves around the center of mass, so should the emission lines from the broadline region that it carries go back and forth in velocity. Okay. So this is an example of the kind of line profile that we might expect from the system. I've colored in red the emission lines from the narrow line region, and those mark the frame of the binary. This is the broad emission line that follows the orbit of the, um, of, of the accreting black hole. And we have one observable, the velocity shift, which I indicate as U2. Okay. And ideally, if we observe for a long enough time, this peak of the broad line should go back and forth like this. Now, in this particular case, U2 is of order a couple of thousand kilometers per second. If we assume some number, say U2 equals 1,000 kilometers per second, it really represents the projection of the orbital speed according to the inclination of the binary and the phase angle. Um, if, we, if we ask what kind of binaries can we, find, can we expect to find if we search for displaced peaks that are shifted by a few thousand kilometers per second, um, we can go through the uh, equations of binary motion and we find that the binaries we expect are, uh, should have periods of order a few hundred years and sepa orbital separations of order a tenth of a parsec. And that's based on the assumption that the, mass of the, black, the masses of the black holes are around 10 to the 8 solar masses and some guess about the inclination and phase of the binary, around 45 degrees. But there's a very wide variety uh, in numbers, especially since we don't know the trigonometric functions that determine the projection. So with this idea in mind, uh, my collaborators and I, primarily um, Todd Borison and Jules Halpern, uh, went out to search for um, line profiles that resembled this. We started with an automatic uh, selection algorithm, then we inspected a lot of the spectra by eye, and we selected in the end close to 90 objects from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey that have line profiles that resemble this shape. Here's a couple of examples. You see 
here on the left. This is the H beta line. We have the O3 lines that provide a very good velocity reference. And you see that the broad peak of the line is shifted to the blue relative to the frame defined by the narrow lines. Here's another example where the broad lines are shifted to the red. Um, we can observe the same shift at H alpha and H beta. And in this particular object where the, the red shift is a little bit higher, we can also catch magnesium 2. And we can see that the shifts of all the broad lines are consistent with each other. And that lends some confidence that we might be looking at motion of the entire broad line region. Um, at the end of the day, after surveying all the objects, sorry, after studying the profiles of all the objects that we found, we can construct the distribution of velocity shifts, which looks like this. There's a gap in the middle because we can't easily determine very small shifts. So you can see that the shifts go between minus 4,000 and perhaps plus 4,000 kilometers per second. Okay, so this was the first step in our search. And it only provides us preliminary candidates. The next step is to ask, do the profiles shift with time as the binary goes around? The orbital periods, as I said, are of order hundreds of years. And if the kinds of shifts that we should expect are about 20 kilometers per second per year, you can think of that as an acceleration. If our baseline is between 5 and 10 years, which it was in this case, the shifts might, be, might change by 100 to 200 kilometers per second. So we went and re-observed our sample with a series of telescopes. And we plot here the changes in the velocity. So you can think of this as an acceleration times the time interval. And you see that in about 20% of our targets, the lines moved. Some of them moved to the blue, others moved to the red. The amount by which they moved is more or less consistent with our expectations, which encourages us that we're more or less on the right track. However, we see that the rest frame time interval between observations doesn't really influence how big the shift is, which really tells us that we're looking at a population with, in this context, with a wide variety of, of projection angles, as well as a wide range of periods. And in order to understand what this distribution is telling us, we need population synthesis models, which are now underway. So encouraged by these results, we are now pursuing a very systematic search, uh, sorry, a very systematic campaign to follow up the observations. We want to make uh, more velocity measurements to verify uh, the results we've gotten so far. We want to eliminate the possibility that we're looking at perturbed accretion disks. And an important component of the follow-up program is optical and radio imaging. Radio imaging will give us the highest angular resolution we can hope to get. And we really hope that with that, we can resolve the nearest binaries. <coughs> That would be a very important result if we can get it. Okay. And I hope you appreciate from this uh, presentation that we really need to understand what the broadline region can and cannot do so we can evaluate whether the offset emission lines that we found are really a good indicator of a binary. So with that in mind, uh, let me get to switch gears a little bit and let me get to another class of emission line profiles, those with double peaked shapes. For those profiles, a good case can be made that they arise in the accretion disk around the central engine. Um, it's been known for quite a while from studying binary stars that double peak lines are a signature of rotation. In these particular objects that I'm getting to next, the, the line widths are extremely large, 15,000 kilometers per second typically, 40,000 kilometers per second for the most extreme case. And you see on the right some examples after the narrow lines have been subtracted, you see the double peak structure. This object has an even broader line. Um, this is about 16,000 kilometers per second. Okay. And there's a series of arguments and observational tests done over the past 20 years um, that suggest very strongly that the origin of these lines is the outer accretion disks at distances of a few hundred to maybe one or 2,000 gravitational radii from the center. The lines are skewed and asymmetric, which makes it necessary to include relativistic effects in the calculations of the line profiles, as you can see here. So this is one of the first pieces of evidence that I found very compelling um, to suggest that these lines originate in an accretion disk. The red line is a model that attributes the line emission to an annulus in the disk, a range of radii that differ by a factor of two. Uh, the disk emissivity is a power law in radius, and relativistic effects are included in the weak field approximation. And you can see that the fit is very good. 
We've been following the variability of these profiles since the late 80s. And we've discovered a number of interesting patterns. We've discovered large, large amplitude variability, which you can see in this series of spectra of NGC 1097. Time starts over here, goes up like this, and then you continue over here. So if you look at the black traces, you will see that the pattern that emerges from, from studying the profiles is that the two peaks go up and down like this, this swinging motion. Okay? This develops over a decade. This is a very common pattern of variability. The time scale can be as short as a decade, or it could be even longer. This is the object where the variations happen quickly, and we can actually trace more than two cycles of variation. And to explain this type of variation, we've attempted to modify the simple accretion disk models by including perturbations. The red line here shows you what happens if we paint a spiral arm on the disk, and we allow it to persist at a period that is a little longer than the dynamical time in the relevant part of the disk. And it more or less explains the qualitative behavior of the line profile. We've also been able to uh, catch in the act the development of this perturbation. These are spectra taken one year apart, and you see how one side of the line goes up, takes off. Okay. And now I hope you can uh, see the danger of mistaking one of these strong blue peaks with a single peak but offset line profile. Okay. Uh, we went further, and we looked at the small amplitude variability. We slice the profile into velocity slices, and we take sp power spectra along each velocity slice, and we find low-frequency noise. And to explain this, uh, to interpret these variations, we made models for disks with spots. We've tried different types of spots to represent different flavors of vorticity, star disk collisions, uh, self-gravitating clumps, et cetera. And we conclude that models like this do the best job. The spots are in the outer parts of the disk. And this is just another piece of evidence that suggests that these disks are massive and self-gravitating. So they can develop either local self-gravitating clumps or large-scale instabilities like spiral arms. Okay. Okay. So I have five minutes, I think. So let me get to uh, the more fundamental question now of what is the nature of the broadline region. More modern ideas about the broadline region are based on clues that we get from observations. As Brad Peterson showed you in his talk yesterday, we think that the motion of the broadline gas is virialized. The geometry may be flattened. The results of a reverberation mapping suggest this, but the most recent results are tough to interpret. They don't. They suggest that the flattened geometry and the signature of a Keplerian disk are not universal. So this is something that we have to worry about, and I'll get back to it in the last slide, but I'll, I'll run with this idea for now. So these are pictures from papers that have considered this idea. Um, going back to Emmering, Blanford, and Schlossmann from 1992, this is a, a disk which is losing gas along magnetic field lines. And the gas that's launching from the disk is really the source of the broad emission lines. This is a, a, a later model, a few years later, by Murray and collaborators. This model was originally proposed to explain broad absorption line quasars. But within the context of this picture, there are the seeds the ingredients for perhaps understanding the broad emission line gas. The suggestion is that there is a layer on the surface of the disk that's about to launch as a result of radiation pressure, and that layer is the origin of the emission lines, of the broad emission lines. That layer is not static. That's a very important ingredient of the model. So the, it's got a very small velocity, but a very high velocity gradient because it's starting to lift from the disk. That velocity gradient, coupled with the proper radiative transfer calculation, makes all the difference in the world in, in, in shaping the line profiles. And I just gave a laundry list of papers here of people who have thought about this problem over the years. I've been influenced tremendously by papers by Colin Suprem and Colin Suprem and Dumont, who calculated photoionization models for the thin skin on the surface of the disk, and more recently by papers from Mary and Chang who would try to calculate analytically and in a simple way the radiative transfer through this skin of the disk uh, and produce line profiles. And just to put uh, the pro uh, the, uh, this work in the proper historical context, I've been able to track the history of this question 
all the way back, more than three decades. There's a couple of papers by Gregory Shields where this idea was introduced. He was talking about ablating the outer parts of the disk by radiation that's emitter, emitted in the inner part of the disk. Um, any fans of Bob Dylan in the audience? Okay, so those of you who are fans of Bob Dylan, though, know that the history can be traced even further back, okay? He stated very clearly that the answer is blowing in the wind. And in fact, he did this in 1962. So you can, you can argue that he predicted accretion disk winds, quasar outflows, and even feedback a year before quasars were discovered. So going back to what winds can do, what would have been an, a normally an axisymmetric accretion disk, as a result of radiative transfer, will appear non-axisymmetric. Here is the apparent emissivity of the disk if you follow the trajectories of line photons passing through this accelerating layer. Um, photons that are moving along a large velocity gradient projected along the line of sight to the observer will have an easier time escaping. And those are photons from this section of the disk where the projected velocity is uh, small. So the effect on the line profiles as you increase the optical depth in the emitting layer is to go from broader profiles to narrower profiles. The two peaks get close together, the valley between them is filled, and the line becomes flat topped and it can even be cuspid. So this combined with the large outer radius of the disk can turn what would have normally been a double peak line as a result of rotation into a single peak line. Okay. So to test this idea, these ideas were proposed by Mary and Chang um, Quite a, quite a while ago, but to, to test them properly against the most recent data, uh, my former students and I undertook a more, um, I'll do this backwards, a more systematic comparison of models with data. So you can see here in red, the average profiles from two classes of quasars, the A and the B class, okay? These are more cuspy, they resemble narrow line Seaford 1 galaxies. These are broader, a little more round topped, and with an extended red wing. You find some of these in radio, broad line radio galaxies. And the black line is our model fit using the ideas from Murray and collaborators. Okay. So we do reasonably well, especially if you, if you think that we did a crude analytic calculation um, where, for, to treat a problem that's intrinsically a lot more uh, involved. We also tried to explain the statistical properties of large samples of line profiles. The skewness and kurtosis of the lines are quantities that are easily measured. We can also measure them from synthetic line profiles, and you can see that, that the distributions that we get from our simple calculations match the observations pretty well. So this is an encouraging uh, step, but a lot more needs to be done. Ultimately, we would very much like to explain all of the observed statistical trends, perhaps even the Baldwin effect. Uh, and on the horizon, there are sophisticated models by other groups uh, that treat the radiation hydrodynamics of the wind, and on top of that, they have radiative transfer of line photons. And just to give you an idea of the complications, the Balmer lines, which are not resonant lines, will probably come from the densest layer in the atmosphere of the disk, at the base of the wind. Those are the ones that are relatively easy to treat, and those are the ones that we've studied. If you want to treat the resonance lines, you have a much more difficult problem to tackle. Continuum photons can go through the wind, scatter, get behind the dense clumps that pro might, you might think protect the outer wind, and by following jagged paths, they can photoionize all parts of this wind. Once the line photons are produced, they will have to follow a random walk out of this medium. So you would uh, need a Monte Carlo code to follow what is going on. And the current results from the groups that do these calculations appear quite encouraging. They can reproduce, so these are profiles of carbon-4 lines. You can see that they can reproduce the shape of the emission line, and they can get the troughs that represent the broad absorption lines uh, to be more or less similar to what we observe. This is only the beginning, of course. Um, there's a lot of work to be done to make these models agree with the observations a lot better. Um, but that is uh, 
work by others and a talk for the future. So I will end there. Thank you very much. wants to have a go at answering yeah. the question. Yes. Yeah. Another, yes. Okay. Another test that you can actually do, which is in the spirit of what you're suggesting, is watch lines change from double peak to single peak. In NGC 5548, the long monitoring campaigns have actually found this. Okay. I think the H beta line changes from double peak to single peak. And you can think of that as a. Yes, and in fact, we have observed objects that go from single peak to double peak in their Balmer lines. Yes, it is fairly rare. Yes, I, unfortunately I don't have, I was hoping that I had a picture to illustrate it. That's exactly right. And in fact, in one of the papers by Caillou Chen, maybe it's the first one, Chen, Halpern, and Filipenko, this argument is summarized as follows. The velocity dispersion of the gas that's bound to each one of the black holes is higher than the orbital velocity of the two black holes in the binary. Right. So if you want to construct the profile from a binary, you have to combine two profiles that are broader than their separation. So what you might expect to observe is an undulation in the width and maybe in the asymmetry, but you won't see two separate peaks that move around. Like that. Yes? Is that what you guys are looking for? No, that's not what we're looking for. What we're looking for is one line that's moving back and forth. And the example that I showed you is a line that is offset by less than its width. It, it will go, we want it to go from blue shift to red shift, but we don't want it to move so much that its wings come to zero velocity, right? So it's just, the amplitude of the variation of the line peak should be small, smaller than the width of the wings of the line. So it's more or less what you discovered, uh, what you described. Uh, I just said it in different words. for dissipating the disk. Um, I don't know what the mass loss rates are. Unfortunately, I haven't looked at that number, so I, I can't answer. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Yeah. Model. Yeah. Um, the, the way you would go about finding that number is you look at the necessary density in the disk atmosphere, and you backtrack from there and figure out the, 